to the Good Leadership Breakfast. We're going to get started in about 10 minutes. F uh, grab one extra cup of coffee, find your seat. And while you're doing that, we need your participation. We have the first poll of the morning. Uh, you need to text Good Leadership to 22333 to participate. Grab your phones, get them out, pull them out. This is the time when you can be on your phones. We'll allow it. And answer the first poll question, which will be, as you look toward the end of 2022, how do you feel about achieving the financial goals set by your team? So answer the poll on your phone, and we'll get started in just a few minutes. Two gold bars. They stand for financial expertise, personal guidance, a sign of your success. Do you have them? At Old National Bank, your success is everything. Yeah, so I'll give everybody a couple minutes to answer the poll questions, chat about it with the person next to you. As you look toward the end of 2022, how do you feel about achieving the financial goals set by your team? All right, as you're finishing those poll questions, uh, we're going to get into the program shortly. But first, we have also thank you to Old National Bank, who we saw. And we have one more video. We're going to learn what good leadership is all about. Most people agree the difference between surviving and thriving in business today is good leadership. But what exactly is good leadership? Good leadership is the art and science of people working together to create great results. You see it when leaders with good character multiply their impact with proven success habits. Great results happen when people work together and create a positive impact on their customers, colleagues, and their communities. Good leadership is also a game-changing consulting firm headquartered in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Unlike other firms who coach individuals, Good Leadership coaches teams to exceed their goals, both personally and professionally. The firm's mission is to spread the idea, goodness pays. What's goodness? Goodness in business is when people thrive together in a culture of encouragement, accountability, and positive teamwork. Good Leadership coaches accelerate alignment in teams during disruptive changes in the business and they bring out the goodness in people with a proven process called the Goodness Pays Leadership System. It's worth your time to learn more because leading with goodness is confirmed by research to produce better business results. The secret is here in this exceptional book, How Goodness Pays. So if you wanna explore new ways to produce better results faster, visit goodleadership.com. Thank you, everybody. Good morning. Welcome to the Good Leadership Breakfast. Thank you so much for being here and for investing in yourselves as good leaders. We're so excited to have you all here. We are officially into fall, uh, and we couldn't do this breakfast without our sponsors. Uh, we're so grateful for the, uh, for the support of our sponsors. And I'm very pleased to welcome the two people I'm on stage with, Natalie Watkins, Employee Health and Benefits Consultant, Marsha McLennan Agency, and Steve Ryan, a partner at Taft. Uh, Natalie, can we hear from you first? Why do you sponsor the Good Leadership sure. Breakfast? Good morning, everyone. Um, it's great to be here. Nice to see everyone. My name is Natalie Watkins, and um, Employee Health and Benefits Consultant with Marsh McLennan Agency, also known as MMA. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with us, we are um, in the business of risk management and employee health and benefits consulting work. So we're literally just down the road, about half a mile here in Golden Valley, and we partner with uh, mid-size employers um, here locally, nationally, and globally as the extension of their finance and um, HR team. So as we're in the business of investing in and being there for our clients, our colleagues, and our communities in the moments that matter, um, it's really a true honor to, to partner with the Good Leadership community. So a thank you to Paul and the Good Leadership team for the opportunity to sponsor them and partner with them. Um, our amazing clients who are here today for your incredible partnership and um, to Pete for joining us as our guest today. All right, Steve Ryan. All right, well, good morning. Uh, I'm Steve Ryan. I'm a partner at the law firm at Taft, Satinius, and Hollister. Uh, but until about two and a half years ago, I was the president managing partner 
of a firm many of you in this room probably heard of, Briggs & Morgan, Twin Cities law firm. Uh, for 100 years, Briggs served its clients uh, on some of their most sophisticated and challenging legal matters, including of relevance to this morning's discussion, uh, representing the Minnesota Twins on the development and construction of Target Field and the Minnesota Vikings on the development and construction of U.S. Bank Stadium. Uh, now, way back in 2017, uh, the Briggs leadership team was meeting to talk about strategic planning, and we realized, as one of my colleagues was fond of saying, that, that what made us successful during the last 100 years was not going to make us successful during the next 100 years. And that was about the time that Kevin Warren, who then was the chief operating officer of the Vikings, now the commissioner of the Big Ten, uh, told me I needed to call Paul Batts. Uh, and I am glad we did. Uh, Paul and the team at Good Leadership helped the Briggs leadership team lead through a period of disruptive but ultimately transformational change, uh, culminating on January 1, 2020, with the merger of the Briggs law firm into the Taft law firm. Uh, today, Taft is nearly 800 lawyers across all major Midwestern markets, and that includes Minneapolis, Chicago, uh, Indianapolis, Cincinnati, Cleveland, Columbus, and I'm proud to announce that effective at the end of this year, we'll add Detroit to that list of markets uh, with the addition of 120 fantastic lawyers at the Jaffe Law Firm uh, in Michigan. Everybody in this room has dealt with difficult and transformative change, um, and one of the great things about the Good Leadership Breakfast is it gives us a forum to come together and share those experiences and talk to each other about it. And I'm particularly excited to hear from our guest, Pete Bavacqua, who I said last night I wasn't going to say your name, but I did, so there it was, Bavacqua. Uh, and uh, we're excited to hear what he has to say, too. So uh, on behalf of everyone at Taft, welcome. Thank you for being here, uh, and enjoy the conversation. Well, it is fall. I am so honored to be here to kick off the fall series. Uh, I have the... I, <laughs> I have the honor of saying summer is over. Uh, and, uh, but we're, we're so glad to have everybody in the room. And I know that sometimes fall can feel like the beginning of a business year because everybody's sort of coming back from vacation and everybody's gearing up right to go into the winter season. And uh, we are grateful that you are here investing in yourself as a good leader. We wouldn't, uh, y y thank you, sorry. <laughs> We've, we are seeing behind the scenes, right? Some teleprompter issues. Anyway, it's my fault. Uh, before the interview, uh, I'm excited to introduce an important good leadership tool, and that is the 7Fs wheel. Now, if you've been to the breakfast before, you likely have, you're familiar with this tool, and you also know the value of this check-in, this continuing check-in. So find the QR code on your notepad. Uh, this is going to be another activity on your phone. We're going to have you pull, pulling out your phones every once in a while throughout the breakfast so that we can get some data from you, and so that you can save this 7Fs wheel exercise for the next breakfast you come back to. The 7Fs serve as a powerful scorecard to measure how you are thriving in your life, both personally and professionally. And as you look at the tool, the tool measures your satisfaction in your life with faith, family, finances, fitness, friends, fun, and future. And each of those Fs is rated on a scale of 1 to 10, one means it couldn't be any worse. Ten means it couldn't be any better. So I'll give you a minute to fill out the tool. Benny, can you uh, play some 7Fs music for us? And take a second to fill out the tool. At Good Leadership, we believe that leaders who have a wide and expansive 7Fs wheel live with less stress and lead with less fear. And we believe, exactly the question that we just asked you to discuss at your tables, we believe that people can grow in their 7Fs just as much at work as they can at home. Now, it's the time you've been waiting for. It's, uh, it is my pleasure to introduce the founder and creator of the Good Leadership Breakfast. He is a thought leader in the executive coaching industry whose firm, Good Leadership, is creating the category of executive team coaching. And he is my good friend. Please welcome Paul Botts. Thanks for coming back into the ballroom. It's super exciting to have people here. Um, in the field that we operate in, in executive coaching and leadership development, this season is like the tax season is for accountants. 
Everybody wants to get started on new things after Labor Day, and it just means we're flying all over the place. And one of the things I love about the Good Leadership Breakfast is I can guarantee I'll be here on three dates, on, on Friday dates in the fall. So thanks for joining us on that. There's been a couple of themes that have uh, emerged over the last decade that I wanted to talk about today. Um, this is a special breakfast for lots of reasons. One of the themes is that when we first engage in new organizations and we start talking about leadership, it's, it's fascinating how the conversation is about sort of individual leadership. And there's lots of reasons. Our society is kind of going individual, you know, social media and things like that. But when we talk about leadership, originally people talk about courage and character and judgment and resilience. And all those are sort of individual metaphors. You hear things like, uh, you know, dig deep, reach for the sky, pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Um, we don't think about it that way at Good Leadership. So good leadership, the way we think about it, is a plural. It's a plural discussion. The definition of good leadership is the art and science of working together to create great results. The most important words there are working together. Good leadership is a plural concept. It's about others. And it's fundamentally about teams. So that's the shift that we help people make. And it's really exciting when people start to really actually believe in the team more than they believe in themselves. So that's what we're all about here at Good Leadership. And it's pretty fun and exciting. And when we, We're seeing clients over the last decade really start to shed this hierarchical chain of command kind of way of thinking. And the ones that are surviving and thriving the most are these ones that create this teams of teams culture. And those teams, of course, have to be linked together with you know, good leaders who make sure everybody's aligned and committed and accountable. What's so fun about this is that my wife and I, my Melinda, we started this firm almost 13 years ago. And we just had this vision that we could work in the space of executive coaching and leadership development and also organizational performance. Because we think the only way to really judge a good leader is how well are people working together to create the results that we promised. So we asked that question of you when you first got here with your phones, how are you doing on your goals this year? And so almost half said we're going to nail it, and then 39% said we're really close, we need to do something to push it over the edge. So the timing of this breakfast probably couldn't be any better, right? We're hoping you find something today in my comments and in the research and what we're going to hear from our coach Kelsey and particularly from Pete that might help you push your business results over the edge. So one of the things that's really important is that we talk about the fact that everything we do serves this idea that goodness pays. Goodness pays. We've proven it with research. And goodness is when people thrive together in a culture of encouragement, accountability, and positive teamwork. So we're going to do a little research here in a second on encouragement, accountability, and positive teamwork. And what's fascinating about this is that we're... Um, We've also got some other exciting things that are going on today, and that is we're launching our book, our most recent book. I'm going to talk about that in a second, but today is the 98th episode of the Good Leadership Breakfast. Yeah, it's, it's the 98th, and so I know I've got a slide that's got some pictures. So you're going to meet Pete Bavacqua here in just a second, but um, we're working towards the 100th. I know we have a slide for this. So we're working towards the 100th Good Leadership Breakfast. So Bill George, he's a celebrity in this market. He's the one who actually put Medtronic on the map. And he's been running the, the undergraduate Harvard uh, Business School in leadership. So he's going to be here in November on our 100th episode. And before that, in October, we have uh, Lisa Wright. Now, no one in this room knows Lisa Wright except for our coaching team. She is a fabulous and fierce leader who's running one of the largest uh, public health programs, public health plans in the state of Texas. She lives in Houston. They serve the poorest of the poor. And she is a fantastic leader, and we invited her to come to Minnesota in October. She said she wouldn't do November. <laughs> so uh, she's gonna, we, we're super excited about her. And then today, of course, we're going to meet Pete Bavacqua, who's, uh, who runs NBC Sports. The reason why we chose three, these three speakers is because the theme of, the, of this fall is why should we feel optimistic about our future? And the reason we chose that is because, you know, in November we have an election season, right? And we've got 
all sorts of reasons that we're reminded about the negative news bias in the media. We call it the dark noise. And to be just literal, we need everybody in this room to have a 9 or a 10 on future on your 7F's wheel. So we're tapping into these fabulous leaders, and we're going to ask, I'm going to ask the question of all three. Why do you think we should be optimistic about our future from your point of view? It's pretty exciting. Well, and also, we have, you have a book on your table. We're going to send you home with, those, with a book. This is our latest book. It's the ninth book that we've published under the Good Leadership Press um, label. And I have to confess, we've been working on this particular book for about uh, six years. Um, it's a database book based on the idea that over the last 10 years, the amount of information that we have as leaders to run our businesses has absolutely exploded. There's been a tidal wave of things that we can tap into to run every part of our business. But what's fascinating to me is most people still run their teams with gut feel. We've developed a data-based approach, so a survey. It's called the Team Momentum Survey. We've been using it for 11 years. We've worked with over 350 teams, uh, 750 repetitions on this thing, and we've figured out a couple of really cool concepts. One's called epoxy theory. We're going to talk about that with Pete. These ideas around healthy tension. But the fact of the matter is, is you can have a dashboard to look at to tell you how aligned, committed, and accountable your team is. It was super fun to write about all these client stories. I'll talk about it a little bit more before we're done here today. So we're really happy that you can be a part of launching the book for us today. So what I want to do now is to introduce my colleague, Kelsey. So we have roughly 20 coaches at Good Leadership. Um, we're scattered all over the country. Kelsey lives here in town. And uh, Kelsey and I have been working together on all sorts of fun things in business, healthcare, sports, and entertainment. It's really been fun. Uh, Kelsey's one of my favorite people. Please join, join me in welcoming Kelsey. Yeah, thank you so much for having me, Paul. I get the fun job of getting more data from the group in the room and, and really getting to read the pulse of the room. So it's our chance to hear from you and engage with you in conversation. Mm -hmm. So I will introduce our first poll. We've got, um, you, you referenced it, Paul. We're going to talk about goodness. So our first poll is, a question is this. Uh, from the definition of goodness, which Paul just shared and you'll see on screen, which of those three elements do you see and feel the most right now in your work? So reminder, you can text good leadership to 22333 and then send in your response. All right. That's fascinating. We, things are still moving, but we're, we're sticking with about the same numbers. It really is. So, you know, I always try and predict what we might see walking mm -hmm. into the room. And from the work that we've been doing lately, Paul, positive teamwork jumped out to me. When, I, when we've been on these retreats together, I think there's, and you feel it in this room today, there's still this energy of we're back together, we're in mm -hmm. person. Mm -hmm. And so I think I've seen a lot of that come mm -hmm. through. So it's interesting to see how evenly divided it is. I'm curious what your thoughts are. This is the uh, positive teamwork is, is scores much higher in this room than in any other room we do this work. I mean, you guys are here because there's a, an energy about what we do and a belief system, and you are positive people. When we do the same poll other places, positive teamwork is never the highest one. So it, I mean, it's just the reality we're all living in. So you should congratulate yourselves on that for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. All right, so to our next poll question, from that same definition of goodness, which of these three elements do you see and feel the least right now in your work? Encouragement, accountability, positive teamwork. Thanks. like we're in a pretty good spot with our results. So this one's a little clearer. <laughs> yeah. This, yeah. Yeah. And this is also predictable, too. Yeah. And what's fascinating about it is that when we, so when I started my conversation with you here, we talked about when, when people talk about leadership, they think about uh, individual concepts mm -hmm. first. Uh, that's what happens when we see accountability. At Good Leadership, we think about accountability as a plural co concept. That if you actually have a team of people who care about each other, both personally and professionally, accountability goes way up. Why? Because I don't want to let you down. 
And so if that condition isn't there, accountability is lacking, and we see that all the time. Yeah, it's a, it's a great point because it's that we lean on metrics often, and, and it's strongest when you have both, and it's epoxy theory, which I know yeah. you're going to talk a bit more about That's right. later, so I won't steal that thunder. <laughs> um, great. Thank you for your participation. So we have one more poll. Uh -huh. um, again, from the definition of goodness, which of these three elements makes the biggest difference, would make the biggest difference in your business results if it were stronger? So we've got encouragement, accountability, and positive teamwork. We'll take the music. This, so this, <laughs> my initial reaction, Paul, is I want to grab the accountability people and the positive teamwork people and throw them at a table together to yeah, hash yeah. this out, right? Yeah, that's exactly right. <laughs> and, and in some ways, this is a trick question because we've already kind of made the case that positive teamwork creates accountability. So, you know, we've done the research to ask about which one of those three concepts has the highest economic value, and every single time it's positive teamwork. And so... Um, Part of our point here is this, that positivity is not necessarily sort of a marshmallow, duckies, and bunnies concept. It means that people can be honest with each other and say, you're just not getting it done this week. What do I got to do to help you? But next week, we can't, we can't have this again. I mean, I, I love you. I know you got lots going on, but your goals are my goals. We got to get there. And that's the kind of shift that we make when we do this kind of work. And you know, it's just exciting to have a forum of you here today to, to talk about it. Yeah. So thank you, Kelsey. Thanks. Yeah, yeah, let's give it up for Kelsey here. So this is a reminder, you're, you're not done using these things. You can actually text questions in to Kelsey uh, during the conversation we're gonna have with Pete just now. So you can still use this. There's a, a, a question that comes up that you can get into and, and, and put your thoughts in. So um, without a doubt, I have been sitting on pins and needles for about four months to do this breakfast. I asked Pete Bavacqua if he would consider being a part of this, and he said yes, he would. And we've had sort of a fast and furious friendship. Uh, Melinda and I met Pete for the first time in November of last year in New York City at a dinner. And it was a spectacular dinner. Um, it felt like when we were done, we were old friends. And I thought to myself, this guy does not behave like a super high-powered, high-visible executive. And when I asked about the breakfast, he had lots of intriguing questions about what are we going to do, what are we going to talk about. And I said, you know what, I'm just going to interview you about things that none of us would have any insight into at all. So Pete Babakwa, I first learned about him when he was the CEO of the PGA Tour. And his reputation was of a guy that would treat the local club pros, like at Braemar or Hiawatha Golf Course, the same way he treated the people who played on the PGA Tour on you know, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And so I think that kind of style, especially you know, there are reputations that get formed in the media and in sports. And I'm super excited to introduce you to this guy who's a fabulous family man, a really interesting, uh, warm, gentle guy to get to know. There were a few of us who had dinner with him last night. It was a spectacular experience, so I'm really excited to introduce you to Pete Bavacqua. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. So um, this interview will be a little bit different because we're going to stand, and I'm going to have you explain why. How are you feeling these days? Yeah, I'm feeling good. I had uh, neck surgery on July 28th. I played a lot of football growing up and uh, had two back surgeries. Never had an issue with my neck, but I was sleigh riding with my kids last winter. <clears throat> Aggravated my neck, it got better. I was at a conference, I woke up one morning, it was hurting me again, long story short, CAT scans, MRIs, old football injury, they had to go in, you could probably see the scar, some of you, take out three discs, put in three artificial discs and fuse it. So I feel good, I feel great. The pain's gone, the numbness is gone. But I told Paul, I can't really turn my neck, but I can turn my body. Yeah. So it's a lot easier to stand yeah. and uh, 
Plus, I like standing more. Yeah, anyway. and, and it's thus, more, it's more comfortable. thus and I'm the Italian, pins and so needles for me, right? When I heard he was one, underwent the knife, I was like, oh my gosh. Yeah. So we're glad you could travel. So uh, will you just give us the short story? What, what is your journey? Uh, I, I don't imagine you actually, when, like, when you were in high school, thought you would have the job you have today. So tell us a little bit about that journey. Yeah, I had no idea what I wanted to do. Grew up uh, just outside of New York City. Uh, school was always important in my house. I'm the youngest of five kids. I have four older sisters. Uh, my father was a dentist, and I always say dentists are some of the greatest talkers in the world because they have to carry conversations. Yeah, They're one-sided yeah, yeah, yeah. conversations. <laughs> one-sided conversations, yes. So we were also this over-the-top Notre Dame family, brainwashed from birth. I was going to go to Notre <laughs> Dame. My sisters were going to go to Notre Dame. My father went to Notre Dame. And uh, I was a good high school student, and lo and behold, I was at Notre Dame uh, and absolutely loved it. Was an English major because I really still had no idea what I wanted to do. When I graduated from Notre Dame, I kind of had it narrowed down to film school or law school, which couldn't be more different. Yeah. I probably had the only parents in the United States who were actively pushing me to film school <laughs> and saying, don't go to law school. We have friends that are lawyers. No offense. They, yeah. all, they, all, they all seem miserable. Uh, so I taught for a year. I went back to where I had gone to, to high school, and it was from K through 12, and it was one of the great years of my life. I taught sixth grade algebra, eighth grade English, 11th grade English. I coached the eighth grade football team, the eighth grade basketball team, and the varsity golf team, and kind of figured out what I wanted to do. So I ultimately chickened out and went to law school. Went to law school at Georgetown, uh, not because I wanted to be a lawyer, but just because I liked being a student. And I was like, yeah, I could kind of figure things out for another three years. $150,000 in debt at the end of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But mm -hmm. ended up loving law school. Absolutely had a blast at Georgetown. Found myself at a big firm in New York, Davis Polk. And right at that time, my father passed away. And he was a big influence in my life. And he passed away in a car accident, of all things. And what my father would always tell me, because he, you know, my last moments with my father was when I was at Davis Polk. Oh, sure. And I wasn't playing any golf. Mm -hmm. And I kind of was getting, like, gray looking. Because as a young associate at a law firm like this, you just work endless, endless hours. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And he would always say, he goes, you know, no matter what, if you don't enjoy what you're doing, mm -hmm. life is going to be a grind. Mm -hmm. So a couple of years after he passed away, I was doing a closing at Davis Polk, and I pulled down the Davis Polk alumni directory. Like, where did all these people who were lawyers here when they left, like, where did they go? And this was literally in the middle of the night, and we lived two blocks away, my then fiance, now wife. And I started going through the names, and I got to Romney Burson, and she was the chief legal officer of the United States Golf Association. And it was just like a, oh, that ding. It was like that. It was like a light bulb went off. Like, wow, that's right. Like, sports organizations need lawyers too. Sure. And I wrote her a letter, literally a letter, not an email, because this was like emails were still a little new. And I, I mailed the letter with my resume. Didn't hear anything for about a year. And I was happier now at Davis Polk. I was a little bit older, a little bit more experienced. And she called me one day out of the blue. It was right after the 2000 US Open at Pebble Beach that Tiger won by yeah. 15 shots over mm -hmm. Ernie Els. And she said, hey, we want for the first time to hire a full-time corporate attorney. Would you be interested? And I rented a car, went out there, got the job at the USGA. So quickly, I went from Davis Polk to the USGA as in-house counsel, did that for about two years. And then David Fay, the longtime executive director, came into my office and said, hey, we'd love for you to run the US Open. And that was, for me, a dream come true. As sure. a kid who, you know, my, I, from when I was 10, every summer through high school, through Notre Dame, even through my first year at law school, I worked at a golf course. Caddy, then ran the golf shop, and golf was always a part of my life. And all of a sudden, I was running the US Open, which was a blast. Did that for a few years, and then oversaw the business side of the USGA as their chief business officer. So that's when I got involved with sponsorships and media. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> left the USGA after about 11 years and went to creative artist agency, CAA, which is really known for mm -hmm. representing mm -hmm. you know, talent and music, movies, film, music of that sort. But I started their golf business. And it was fascinating to kind of be on that side of sports and understanding how corporations think about sports. 
And then these little chance moments in your life, enjoying that. And I got a call one day from the PGA that they were looking for a new CEO. And I interviewed, and I'm like, wow, this is, this is where I'm headed. This is golf. This is what I was born to do. And move the family down to Florida as the CEO of the PGA of America. And it was seven wonderful years. Really enjoyed it. I would say my best professional moment to date by a mile was the Ryder Cup at Hazeltine. You know, that week right here, here. Yeah, yeah. Those, <clears throat> but those seven days, first of all, you know, Team USA needed a victory more than ever. And for those of you that were there, I mean, it was yeah. seven days of just like spectacular sunshine. It yeah. was just perfect. And uh, I really enjoyed the PGA of America. It was getting a little repetitive. And I started to listen to some opportunities, and this is public, so I'm not saying yeah. anything I shouldn't, but I was, I was offered the job of being the CEO of the USOC. And I found that that would be really- The Olympic Committee. The, the Olympic yeah, Committee. That's right. And I was thinking, you know, that's the, the, they need help. Yeah. That could be yeah. interesting, <laughs> yeah. And I was, I was gonna do it. Mm -hmm. And they said, you know, I hadn't told our board yet, which was gonna be a whole nother conversation, and they needed a reference because of everything they had been through, and we have to check mm -hmm. all the boxes. Mm -hmm. So I said, oh, you know, you should call this Mark Lazarus. And Mark was the chairman of NBC Sports. And I said, I, I admire Mark, and I've worked across the table from Mark. And about a week later, Mark called me, and I thought it was going to be, hey, Pete, the, I, the USLC called me, and I told them you're a good guy, and you know, good luck, and it's going to be fun working together. But it wasn't that. It was, hey, I didn't know you were ready to leave the PGA of America. But before you go do that, I've been told by NBC they wanted Mark to get elevated to run all of television and streaming, but I need to find somebody to come in and do my job. And I wish I could say, you know, I took out the good leadership book and, you know, a yellow legal pad and the pros and cons, but thought about it for literally a second. I said, Mark, yeah, let's do that. Yeah. And went home and had a great conversation with my wife, Tiffany, and said, hey, we're going to go back to the New York area, and I get to work for this historic brand, NBC, and sports, and it's not just golf, it's everything. And then we got our three kids together, who are now 14, 12, and 9. My daughter's 14, the boys are 12 and 9. And I said, hey, Dad's going to go work for NBC. And they said, what's NBC? <laughs> you know, which, which was a kick in the gut, but also important. Yeah, that's right. Because, you know, you think about when, when we grew up and, uh -huh. you know, you watched Happy Days and Laverne and Shirley and <laughs> there weren't many choices, but my kids consume content continuously, but none of it starts on NBC, CBS, Fox, or ABC. It all starts on YouTube and Netflix yeah. and Amazon. And I was like, well, that's interesting because here I'm going to an iconic American brand, but if we don't hustle and change and adapt, we're going to wake up and feel like we own the corner record uh -huh. store. So that challenge of that really motivated me, and now it's been about four years at NBC, uh -huh. and, and I love it. So, so that, was, that was a long answer. Sorry. It's okay. Yeah. It's, uh, it's, it's your stage, and you're standing. <laughs> so there you go. Um, not everyone in this room is a sports fan. Uh, not well, everyone understands all the acronyms. <laughs> yeah. um, you and I have talked about many different things, but I'm fascinated when I say, you know, when I talk about you being in sports, you go, well, not, not really. I'm not really in sports. Help us think about how you think about what you're doing. Yeah, well, certainly, you know, I remind people constantly that when we work together that, hey, we are in sports and we should be positive. And because sports is both a great teacher, it's a great catalyst for change, but it's also a form of escapism for people. Mm -hmm. I mean, people go home after a long week and put on a college football game or a Sunday night football game, and they, you know, they forget about things for a while. So that's important to re you know, maintain being positive. But we're really in the storytelling business, mm -hmm. and we're in the storytelling business in a media environment that's under such constant change. Mm -hmm. So your parents pushing you into film school, you feel like you're there now, right? Yeah, in a way, absolutely. I mean, and I think the best example of that is really the Olympics. Mm -hmm. And you think about something like Sunday Night Football. So Sunday Night Football is on NBC. It's been the number one show on television for 12 years in a row, which is you know unheard of. Mm -hmm. uh, and you have people that everybody knows. You have Tom Brady. You have Patrick Mahomes. You have these stars. Carrie Underwood. And Carrie Underwood, who yep, starts that's it right. off. Yep, yeah, that's absolutely. right. Absolutely, who's, who's a wonderful person. The Olympics are different. 
So the Olympics, whether it's the summer or the winter Olympics, you have 17 consecutive days. We had 7,000 hours on in Tokyo when you combine NBC, USA, CNBC, the Olympic Channel. And for every Simone Biles and Michaela Schifrin and Usain Bolt, you have a thousand people nobody's heard of. Mm -hmm. And how do you have these amateur athletes in most instances with few exceptions like basketball and hockey goes back and forth, but how do you put them on the American stage and tell their story? And if Molly Solomon was here, and Molly's our executive producer for the Olympics, she would say, yeah, we have to think about the Olympics not as a sporting event, mm -hmm. but as a dramatic series. And tell the story about that US volleyball player and what she went through mm -hmm. to get to the Olympics mm -hmm. and her family story and how her entire town is behind her. And you create these mini films, mm -hmm. these mini dramas to introduce these characters to an American audience. And the Olympic audience, the viewership audience, is one of the few sports where it's actually more female viewers than male viewers. Mm -hmm. It tilts female. Yeah. And that's because we combine that great element of storytelling with these great athletic achievements. And the Olympics are they're at a, they're at a pretty precarious moment. Uh, in their essence, nothing's as great as the Olympics. It's a celebration of sports. It brings the world together. But we've seen a little bit of fatigue because you go from Sochi to Rio to Pyeongchang to Tokyo to Beijing, and that's been difficult. Mm -hmm. And particularly, you know, because of the postponement of Tokyo, we had two Olympic Games, a Summer Games and a Winter Games within six months of each other. They both were struggling through COVID. So people who tuned in, they saw venues without spectators. We couldn't have those great friends and family moments. Mm -hmm. I was in Tokyo for 40 days. It was like a prison sentence. I was in Beijing for two weeks. It was like a, a worse prison sentence. Mm -hmm. And so now what we're doing, which is really intriguing, is the team has come together and said, OK, we have to turn this on its head. How can we recalibrate how we tell these Olympic stories? How can we celebrate the fact that we've now turned this corner mm -hmm. and we're going to Paris for the Summer Olympics and then to Italy for the Winter Olympics and building up to a crescendo of LA in 28 for mm -hmm. the Summer Olympics. Mm -hmm. But it's challenging. And one of the great kind of wake up calls I had is when I got back from Tokyo, my family was up in Maine and I flew home on a Monday and I went to my house and my niece was at my house who had just graduated from Indiana and she was going to drive up to Maine with me. And she's a, she's a really smart kid, and her father's a film professor. There's a lot of film stuff in our family. Mm -hmm. And I said to her, her name's Gabriella. I said, hey, did you watch the Olympics? And she goes, yeah, I watched, I watched everything. It was great. And I said, oh, that's, that's wonderful. What did you think of Mike Tirico? Mike, Mike Tirico's the face of NBC Sports. Mm -hmm. if, if you watch the Olympics, I mean, he was on for thousands of hours. And she goes, I didn't see Mike. And I said, well, well how, the, how the hell did you watch the Olympics and not see Mike Tirico? <laughs> and what she said, I got chills. She goes, oh, I watched it all on TikTok. And for better or for worse, she felt like she had a full Olympic experience mm -hmm. by watching clips on TikTok. Mm -hmm. And here we are investing you know, hundreds of millions of dollars mm -hmm. of bringing the Olympic Games. Mm -hmm. And yet this 21-year-old woman felt like she knew everything she needed to know by watching it on TikTok. Mm -hmm. And that goes back to the comment my kids made when I said I was going to take the job, you know, what is NBC? Mm -hmm. And my biggest fear, what keeps me up at night, is that younger generation, my kids, that 14, 12, 9, they follow sports, but they're not watching sports. And I played sports my whole life, reasonably good athlete. My wife was a college athlete. We were talking about how my wife played college basketball. My kids all play sports. When I was growing up and watching a Notre Dame football game, I mean, we would sit down. And if Notre Dame was winning, I mean, you wouldn't move out of the chair. If you were chewing a piece of gum, you'd keep chewing the piece of gum. Like, you wouldn't disrupt the, the Notre Dame mojo. And it was, <laughs> it was a religious experience. Yeah, that's right. My 12-year-old son, who's a good little football player, he'll sit down for 30 seconds and watch maybe a couple of drives, and then boom, he's outside or mm -hmm. he's doing something else, or God forbid he goes on his iPad. Yeah. And so there's two schools of thought. Like, well, well they'll mature into a viewing audience or they won't. And I'm of the opinion they won't. 
Mm -hmm. because that's not how kids consume content anymore. And that's not how, whether they go to school or talk to their friends or watch a movie, they're just not programmed to sit down for three hours and pay attention mm -hmm. to a game. Mm -hmm. So I talked about this a little bit last night with a couple of people that were at dinner. So how do you combat that? How do you make it stickier for these kids? How do you use analytics and data and make it more interactive? So that's, that's first and foremost things we have to, one of the things we really have to figure out. And I was talking about, you know, what the Minnesota Vikings mm -hmm. are trying to do. They mm -hmm. have the same challenges. Yep. And it's tough. So in preparing for today, um, I asked if I could ask you about the China experience more. So when you think about the Olympics, and as we read about all the drama before the Olympics, the COVID and societal changes in China, it seemed to me that you're more into geopolitics by broadcasting this. So what, what were some of the challenges that were related to China? There were all the operational changes of how do you conduct an Olympics during COVID in Beijing, which was on super lockdown. And I would tell you for those two weeks I was in Beijing, I was outside for under 20 minutes. You'd go from the hotel to the van, you get tested. You'd go from the van to the Olympic Center, which is the broadcast center, underground, get tested, stay there all day, back to the hotel, have dinner, try to go to bed. Because you couldn't go outside. You couldn't even go to the venues. So there were the operational concerns. But more important than that, it was how do you celebrate the Olympics mm -hmm. when you see an opening ceremony where you have you know, President Xi and Putin in the same audience, mm -hmm. and what does that signify? Mm -hmm. And the great IOC and USOC sponsors, like the Visas of the world yeah. and the Coca-Colas of the world, they all went silent. So now we're out there on an island trying to, to somewhat delicately bang the drum of the Beijing Olympics and not invite all the skepticism and the anger about the human rights issues. Mm -hmm. And then from a, 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 a pure production standpoint and storytelling, you have to strike that balance. We can't ignore the fact that these games are in Beijing because we'll get taken to task for putting our head in the sand. But we don't want to depress everybody because <laughs> they want to watch the Olympics because they want to see these great events and they want you know, the power of sports to come through. So there were countless meetings about how do we balance that how do we point out where we are and what the issues are, but yet tell great Olympic stories? Mm -hmm. And that's when you really are thankful you have somebody like a Mike Tirico mm -hmm. who can kind of navigate that so, I don't want to say effortlessly because it took a lot of effort, but so professionally where he could touch on the human rights issues and then correct course and talk about the sports. And we also made the decision that, okay, NBC Sports is going to focus on the sports. And Lester Holt and NBC News, are, they'll focus on the human rights issues. Mm -hmm. So it was a bit of a church and state approach. Mm -hmm. But it was incredibly complicated. Mm -hmm. And that's part of the beauty of the Olympics. And if you, you know, you, the Kofi Annan would always say, you know, that's the power of the Olympic Games and the power of sports in general is that it just kind of transcends through all the politics and sports, if used properly, can be a great unifier. Uh, and I believe that, but you can't ignore the bad story. Yeah. And you know whether that was over the course of the last couple of years and you've seen the NFL's response uh, and more leagues, I think the NBA is way out in front of doing a great job about balancing talking about social justice issues mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and sports. The NFL is caught up a bit we're making sure we try to tell the difficult stories, the hard stories, mm -hmm. uh, but it's a constant challenge mm -hmm. because you're always gonna get criticized mm -hmm. by half the population for doing too much and half the population mm -hmm. for not going far enough. So uh, you know our point of view about good leadership being a team sport, it's right here on the book, for crying yeah. out loud. Um, we interviewed a couple of your people and identified uh, what they think are your success habits. Uh, in running a very complex team with highly paid professionals. And so we identified three things. But before we do that, I want to explain the epoxy theory concept to you. So uh, we can put the slide up here, please. So we've proven that the highest performing teams mix these two concepts. Relational is how much people care about each other. And structural is how we're set up to make decisions and follow through and create accountability. You need equal amounts in order to have a high performing team. But here's the deal. 
Each of us as individual leaders, we lean one way or the other. So we got to learn how to do both. So we discovered through interviews that you are a relational leader. I would say definitely. Yeah. Okay, but you've also learned how to create accountability and to create a high-performing team. And here are the three things that they told us that you're really good at. I'm going to uh, say them each one at a time. And then I want you to just explain just really quickly, why is that important to you and how do you do it? So the first concept is what we call the weather report communication. Everybody watches the weather report one way or another. They tell you what happened and then what's coming. So they said, you're really good at this. So why is that important to you and how do you do it? Yeah, I just I think people don't like to be surprised. They like to know, you know, what's going well. The guy, you know, one of my again films, one of my favorite movies is The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly, right? And I always say, let's talk about the you know, the good, the bad, and the ugly. If we have an issue, let's talk about it. Let's get it on the table. And part of my responsibility is not just to say, okay, here's what we're doing in NBC Sports. Mm -hmm. This is how we're doing. Here's how we're doing financially. Here are the challenges. But I also have to put into focus what's going on at NBCU and what's mm -hmm. going on at mm -hmm. Comcast. Mm -hmm. And even though you know we might be having a great year, there might be other parts of NBCU that are struggling. Yeah. And that's just the way it goes because we're all, it's not just NBC Sports yeah. is all in this together. At NBCU, we're all in this together. So I always think it's important to not let, you know, maybe occasionally a week goes by, but 10 days never go by or I don't have my senior leadership team together saying, okay, like, what's up? Mm -hmm. Like, uh, this is what I'm worried about. What are you guys worried about? What do you think's going well? And getting back to that relationship and structural, yeah, I'm all about relationships. Mm -hmm. And structure, sometimes, I know it's super important and it's fair to people, but it just frustrates me. <laughs> like, I, you know, all the time with org charts and, 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 and titles and people will say, I want yeah. this. And I'm like, you know, what, I, I, call yourself the king of France. You know, I don't care. Just like, here's the job. Let's yeah. do the job. Like, yeah. don't worry about the title. But that's not fair to me. No. Well, because I, you know, I have. Uh, but it does play into your second success habit, which people talk about how you constantly have an others orientation, that you're focused on the people that you're with, and that includes the partners and all these. That you're kind of the last one that you're thinking about. So, t talk about how you think about putting employees and partners first. Yeah, I think that really hit home to me, even more so than NBC at the PGA of America. And you said it when you were talking about, uh, when you were introducing me. So the PGA of America represents 29,000 club professionals and, you know, Tiger Woods, right? So that's, there's a big difference in terms of the challenges and the issues that a top 10 PGA Tour money winner is facing and a 23-year-old assistant professional and what he or she may be facing in Minneapolis, you know, making... $21,000 and a new job out of college. Mm -hmm. And when I took over the job at the PGA of America, having come up through golf, I definitely noticed there was a they versus us mentality. Mm -hmm. That the rank and file PGA of America member said, hey, there's this staff down in Palm Beach Gardens, Florida, and they have a deal with BMW and they're driving around in BMWs and they're enjoying the Florida weather. And like, they don't know what we're going through. They're out of touch. And so I really went out of my way to tell our staff, to tell our team, like, hey, listen, just simple things. Like, if you get back to your office and you have a voicemail from a, that 23-year-old assistant professional or the CMO at BMW, you, you call that professional back mm -hmm. because we work for them. Yeah. And one of the things that would just make my skin crawl is when I would... I haven't played golf because of my neck, but I love playing golf. It's one of my favorite things to do. And when I would go to a club and I would, and one of the professionals would come out, usually you know, one of the younger professionals, and they'd refer to me as Mr. Bavacqua. Like I would just like, ah, I'm not Mr. Bavacqua, I'm Pete, because you know, we work for you. And it took time, but that started to change the culture mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, who's our, you know, an NBC, yeah, we have partners like the NFL and NASCAR and now the Big Ten and Notre Dame and uh, the PGA Tour, the Premier League, the IOC. But, you know, really who, we, who we're indebted to is, you know, people in this room that have just unbelievable options of what you're going to go mm -hmm. put on and watch. Mm -hmm. And so we have to put ourselves in your shoes and give you a reason to do what we do, hopefully, you know, as well or better than anybody. We can never 
we can never take that for granted. We always have to think that way. So the first one was uh, keeping the team in the loop with sort of a weather report style. The second one is others orientation. And the third we heard is that you're always on message. You're not making things up that you are thoughtful and you've got a very structured way of making sure everybody gets that message. Can you just talk about that a little bit? Yeah, well, I think, you know, whether you're running NBC Sports, the PJ of America, or a, or a bake sale, you know, I think it's all about strategy. And I think the mistake a lot of companies make, a lot of corporations, is you develop a strategic plan and it's a thousand pages long mm -hmm. and you put it in a drawer because it's a, uh, <laughs> you know, and there's metrics and yeah. measurements. I think you just have to, you know, somebody who I really admire, the guy Dave Novak, who is the longtime CEO of Yum Brands and just has become a good friend and somebody who I've gone to for guidance. He goes, the main thing is to remember the main thing is the main thing. Mm -hmm. And you know, we're, our main thing is to put out great sports products on television that people like. You know, we don't run car washes. And I think companies sometimes make too many mistakes like branching out and uh, like, let's, hey, this is what we're here to do. Let's do it really well. Let's nail it. Let's make sure we keep Sunday Night Football the number one show on television. Mm -hmm. And let's make some changes. You know, let's make sure we reinvent how we tell the Olympic story mm -hmm. so we can have a successful Paris, Italy, L.A., mm -hmm. and beyond. And I always keep coming back to that mm -hmm. because we're all so busy. We're all moving in a million different directions. All of my senior team has different responsibilities, different challenges. So I think it's my job to kind of always bring them back to that roadmap mm -hmm. and say, okay, now that's great. And how are we, how are we kind of going forward with our strategic plan? Mm -hmm. And you got to call audibles along the way and stay flexible. But if you have that North Star mm -hmm. and you know, okay, this ultimately is what we want to do. And what we say is we make big events bigger. And we do it, you know, like this is me speaking internally, not sounding, you know, arrogant. And we do it better than anybody. And let's keep that going. So when you turn on Sunday Night Football, you're going to feel like, wow, that's big. That's important. When we start having the Big Ten in prime time next year and Saturday, what we told Kevin Warren, this is going to feel big. And Kevin, imagine a situation where you can go on a Saturday from Notre Dame football to Big Ten in prime time to Saturday Night Live. Like, that's big. And then wake up the next morning and you have Sunday night football and football night in America. Like mm -hmm. We're about making big events bigger. And we have that luxury because we're not ESPN. And we don't have to do everything in sports. We don't have to put mm -hmm. several 24-7 sports channels together. So we have our pillars. We have Sunday night football. We have the Premier League. We have the relationship with the IOC. We have the PGA Tour relationship. We have our, our NASCAR relationship, which, is, which we're renegotiating. But we have those pillars anywhere between seven and 10 years. So if you know you have that, mm -hmm. then you have, can afford and really have the luxury of being incredibly picky. Mm -hmm. And we didn't want college football. We wanted the Big Ten. We weren't gonna chase after the Pac-12 or the Big 12. That didn't do it for us. We wanted the best. Mm -hmm. And that's why, you know, Notre Dame, I'm yep. biased, and, and the Big Ten. Yeah, that's well, I feel sense. compelled to say, go Gophers. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's exactly. We, so we have a couple of minutes for you to, to debrief this with people. Yeah. Kelsey, would you tell yeah. us what the exercise so is? So to turn this into more of a coaching exercise, I'm inviting you at your table. So divide your table in half, and we'll take just a few minutes to discuss um, how can you apply the success habits we learned from Pete. So if we could have them back on the screen, that yeah. would be great. Thank you. And Paul will bring you back out when the yep. time is right. Good, thanks. Yeah. So um, thank you very much. This is always the hardest part to pull you back. Um, Kelsey, uh, you have, we have time for one question that came from the audience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the question that came from the audience that we are going to ask today is, what lessons did you learn from your time as an English teacher? that you've brought forward into your career? Wow. I, it's, it's a great, it's a, you were forced to hold an audience and to tell a story. And I think back to that, you know, eighth grade particularly, even more than the 11th grade English class, the eighth grade English class, this was an all boys school, you know, and they're kind of running around and doing a million things and you're trying to teach, you know, 
Huckleberry Finn, and just trying to find the elements of a book or a story that capture their attention is ultimately what I do today, right? How, what, what's going to resonate with that eight-year-old, not eighth grade, so what, 12, 13-year-old boy about this particular book? And I think also what I did in that class that you know, the question reminds me of is I combined you know, visual elements. So I would show scenes from movies. And I remember we were studying a book and I brought in, which maybe in retrospect was a bad decision, but the final scene in Manhattan, Woody Allen's Manhattan, just to show how you could convey emotion just with music. Uh, now it was a little bit bizarre because he was dating Mariel Hemingway and she was 40 years younger than him. So maybe I shouldn't have done that. Yeah, details. But the, yeah. But the, but the, <laughs> yeah. Uh -huh. but the uh -huh. kids got a kick we out of it point. and, and, and it proved a point in, uh, you know, in using the movie to kind of connect them to the book. Mm -hmm. And in many ways, that's kind of what I do now. You know, how do you make things entertaining and interesting? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, Fantastic. That's fascinating. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, thanks, Kelsey. So uh, we're just going to cut right to the most important question. We, we chose this slate of speakers with you to kick us off um, because every one of them has a very different perspective on how they see the world. You talked to us about the Olympics, the fact that people are watching the Olympics on TikTok now, and all these societal changes you're seeing. Why do you think we as leaders should be optimistic about our future? Well, I always think, I mean, you have two choices. You can be optimistic or pessimistic, so you might as well be optimistic. It's <laughs> easier and it's more fun, right? So it starts there. Uh, I think I'm a pretty optimistic person. I think I owe it to my family and you know, my children to mm -hmm. be optimistic. Mm -hmm. And you know, I, I can't tell you how fortunate I feel I am because of what I do with sports. You know, you think about all the issues in this world, and you know, you, we could name a thousand of them right now. But you know, the excitement and the passion and the the, the just the love of live sports, I think, is, has never been more powerful in this country than it is right now. I was saying last night, if you took the top 100 shows from 2021, so a show can be anything, major networks, Netflix, Hulu, uh, HBO Max, Amazon, 88 were sporting events. About 75% of those were NFL games. So there's great optimism in sports, and I see that and I feel that. And I think a perfect timely example where I just left and just said, wow, you know, there's, there's still so much goodness. Is, uh, I was at the Notre Dame game last week when they played Cal, and you walk around that campus and you see these students. And then there was a moment after the game where we went to the locker room, and it was their new coach, Marcus Freeman, who's 36 years old. It was his first victory. And seeing him address that team and their reaction to him and that love and that excitement, I was like, you know what, we, we should be positive because like, this is the next generation, and, and it's, they're, they're, they have a lot to overcome, and they've certainly gone through a lot of challenges, but I think they feel good about what they can do in the world, so that made me feel good. We're grateful to have you here. No, Thank thanks, you so Paul. much. Thank yeah. you. Thanks. Now Thank here comes you, Paul. You, we, we still need you oh, here. Wow. This is the big moment. Yes, yeah. this is the big moment. We're not. You're not. You're not done yet. Uh, all right. Well, thank you so much. I. I. I was taking notes there. I. I was really inspired by so much oh, of what thanks. you were saying. Um, and we are honored to direct a one thousand dollar honorarium on behalf of Pete toward the Evans Scholar Program of the Western Golf Association. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Can you tell well, us what initiative that's going toward? Yeah, I mean, again, I was a caddy. I grew up as a caddy. I think as a young kid, you learn so much about people. Again, the good, the bad, and the ugly about people when you're caddying. And the, the Evans Scholarship and that, what they've done for kids and the amount of kids that they've put through college that are caddies is just amazing. So this was an obvious choice for me. Wonderful. Well, we're, we're thrilled to be a part of that. And uh, now it's the big moment for everybody in the room. Mm -hmm. uh, Pete, we are going to have you draw a business card from the Bucket of Goodwill. Uh, today we raised, in this room, we raised $1,996. And uh, with the generous match from Mark Bergman, that makes it $3,992. It's my job to say uh, they, were, they were charged extra $9.95 shipping charges. Those will all be <laughs> refunded. Yeah, that's right. Uh, straight into my pocket. Uh, no, I'm kidding. I, that's a joke. Uh, <laughs> so, yes, those will all be refunded. So, we are directing almost $4,000 to the charity of someone's choice. 
It is time uh, for Pete to draw a business card. Paul Botts. <laughs> Kristen Larson. Where's Kristen? Kristen Larson, come on up come on, on stage. Now. Where is she? Where is she? Come on, where's Kristen? Right over here. Here she comes. Yeah, thank you. It's, it's always a really long walk, Kristen. <laughs> yeah. Kristen Larson, uh, thank you so much. Welcome. Congratulations. Will you tell us uh, what charity you would like to direct it to and why? I'm going to give it to the Star Legacy Foundation. It's in Minnesota, Stillbirth Research Foundation. Um, I lost my daughter due to stillbirth six years ago, October 20th. Her name is Blakely. I know a lot of women, men in this room have probably experienced miscarriage, stillbirth. I just want to give you guys a hug. Thank I've been you. coming to these breakfasts for about three years, always putting my card in there, knowing that I would get this opportunity to just really, if you haven't um, looked at the Star Legacy Foundation, please do so. Um, I just thank you for this opportunity. Yeah, wow. Wow. Yeah. Powerful. Yeah, well, wonders never cease, right? Mm -hmm. Good. Well, thank you very much, Pete. We're so glad. Uh, and I'm sure you're, he, he's going to hang around for a little bit more if he wants to say hello and shake a hand. He'll do that. I want to go back to the book launch for a second. And I want to tell you exactly what it is you're getting. Um, the survey that we talked about called the Team Momentum Survey has become the centerpiece of everything we do with our clients. I can show you what a dashboard looks like right up right there. We've gotten. Um, We've worked with over 350 teams using this tool. The research on how good leaders create great results with the least amount of personal effort, the superhero effort, is what this is all about. Uh, my goal is to write books you can read on an airplane or in a beach chair sitting, and that you'll use it over and over again. So we're giving this to you today. And if you like it, send us a note. If you really like it, we, uh, we'd love it if you buy it and give it out as gifts to your own team. That would be really awesome. We appreciate your partnership and the fact that you're helping us do this. So to close today, I have a story and a prediction and a challenge. And the story goes like this. Um, right after Labor Day, I was with one of our larger clients, and I was talking to the chief human resources officer. And I said, can you confirm a hunch for me? I said, it seems as if People in the United States of America have taken more paid time off, PTO, this summer than at any time in history. And he said, you're right. We did go back in our, they've been tracking PTO for about 25 years in this organization, and it was 22% higher than in any other period. Why? We just needed to get away from our jobs. It's been wonky. And you know what? Out of that has fallen all this mythology. You've heard about the great resignation. You've heard about the great reconsideration. You've heard about quiet quitting. And he said to me, we just don't see it. It's not happening here. It's also not happening in our industry. I could hire 250 people more tomorrow if I could just find them. They're not leaving our place, and they're not leaving their place, so we don't know where to get them. And so the idea here is that he said something to me that I captured. And he said, I think we're seeing the great recommitment. People are coming back. They're in love with their clients. They're working with people they respect and admire. And they really like the sense of winning as a team. And so here's my prediction. The media loves this concept of the great resignation. It comes up over and over and over again. But it's mythology. Yes, people are moving. But they're not moving at historic rates. So I'm wondering if you can push back on that mythology. I think you should. And particularly, we've gotten some research recently from Gartner that's talking about what the organizations who retain their high performers, what's the one thing they do? They make sure their teams are healthy. Because it's in the team where you develop your friendships and your sense of accomplishment. And so it's a pretty darn easy formula. 
If you want to make sure that people are committed, invest in team leadership and improve teams. And I just love that because that's what we do, and we just wrote about it, and we've got a book there for you. So the challenge is this. Can you go back and reward the people who've recommitted? Don't take that for granted. Say thank you. You might even want to give them a book. Just saying, you're right. And we know where you can get a lot of them. So you know what? Um, we're so grateful that you came back to the Good Leadership Breakfast. It's been a wonky three years. It's been inconsistent in so many ways. It feels consistent to have you here. We're grateful that, we, that Pete was able to make the trip for, due to his health and his busy schedule and things like that. So those of you who've been here before know that we think the highest compliment for any good leader is the phrase, you radiate goodness. So here's where I ask you, are you guys ready to radiate goodness today? Yes. Okay, we can do better than that. Are you ready to radiate goodness today? Yes. Thank you very much. We're going to present two more fabulous speakers in October and November. Have a wonderful day.